We're most fortunate to have Nobel laureate Bob Schiller of Yale and Wharton School's Jeremy Siegel with us for today's keynote. They are taking the stage together for the first time in more than a year to renew their long-running debate on stock price valuations, market predictability, and their implications for researchers and practitioners alike. With the CAPE ratio nearing historic highs, they will address the question I'm sure that has been on the mind of many here these last few months. Are stocks and potentially other asset classes too high? To introduce our esteemed speakers, I'd like to welcome Bruce Jacobs and Ken Levy to the stage. They are principals and co-founders of Jacobs Levy Equity Management, which since its founding in 1986, uh, is a firm that's been built on in, an investment philosophy based on Bruce and Ken's groundbreaking academic research. As well as being thought leaders, Bruce and Ken are successfully managing billions of dollars utilizing the firm's proprietary research. Their gift to our school in 2011 helped establish the Jacobs Levy Equity Management Center for Quantitative Financial Research uh, and its prize for <laughs> quantitative financial innovation. Bruce serves as chair of the Jacobs Levy Center's advisory board, and Ken is also a member. We are pleased to have them here with us to participate in today's program, uh, as well as for their on, uh, ongoing um, uh, munificence with respect to the center. Welcome, Bruce and Ken, and thank you for your continued support. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I'm delighted to introduce Bob Schiller. He's one of those rare scholars whose accomplishments have been recognized not only by his fellow academics, but in the public mind as well. For his lifelong work on asset pricing, he was awarded the 2013 Nobel Prize in Economics. His book, Irrational Exuberance, was a New York Times bestseller and is now in its third edition and he's co-author of two popular books on behavioral economics, Animal Spirits and Fishing for Fools. The Case-Shiller Indices are widely cited, benchmarks for housing price trends, and the cyclically adjusted price-to-earnings ratio, or CAPE, which is the focus of our keynote presentation today, has become an important reality check on market valuation. Bob is the Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale University. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan and earned master's and doctorate degrees from MIT, where he became friends with Jeremy Siegel, who Ken is about to introduce. It's my great pleasure to welcome Jeremy Siegel back to the Jacobs Levy Center because it gives us an opportunity to thank him once again for keynoting at our 2014 conference. Then, as today, the topic was the CAPE ratio, which gives you an idea of how long this debate between Jeremy and Bob has endured. Jeremy is the Russell E. Palmer Professor of Finance at Wharton. He's won numerous awards for his academic writing, including best article from the Financial Analyst Journal and the Journal of Portfolio Management. Also, he has won awards for his teaching, including best business school professor worldwide and Wharton's Lindbeck Distinguished Teaching Award. Jeremy's landmark book, Stocks for the Long Run, published in 1994, is widely credited with helping to usher in the era of the individual investor. Now in its fifth edition, it's been named one of the best business books of all times by the Washington Post and Business Week. Jeremy is a graduate of Columbia and received his doctorate from MIT. So we have two heavyweights here on the stage who can provide us with a stimulating and lively discussion. Gentlemen, the stage is yours. Thank you. I first wanted to just, uh, if you'll allow me, to reminisce about my half century long relation with Jeremy Siegel. That picture, the little yellow, I don't know, who, this is at a party, we were grad students, 1970. Uh, <laughs> do we look any different? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I met Jeremy standing in line for chest x-rays when we first arrived at MIT. And they sent, this is MIT for it, they sent us in alphabetical order. So Schiller and Siegel, you notice, are adjacent. Uh, and our books tend to be adjacent to each other in bookstores because of that uh, also. But, but I say Jeremy uh, really uh, got me started in economics. What I think I appreciated from that very first 
conversation standing in line for a chest x-ray was that it's possible to do economics that's really connected to the real world. Uh, I learned that from Jeremy. <laughs> that, uh, he had a broad uh, scope of knowledge, and it matters. I'm going to talk about the uh, question of the day. Uh, it's on in many people's mind, is, is the market overpriced? I'm going to start out with uh, some CAPE uh, ratio and predicting regressions. I, I'm getting into a little dispute. Uh, Jeremy haven't, and I haven't always agreed on things. But it's not true that he is a perennial bear and I'm a, uh, a perennial bull and I'm a perennial bear. Uh, so we have disagreements. And I'm going to emphasize a little bit. I should say these slides were the work substantially of my co-author, Farouk Givraj. We are going to look at uh, an article that Jeremy wrote a couple of years ago about Cape and uh, pick it apart. Uh, <laughs> I, I survived this over decades with Jeremy. We argue, we come around. And then finally, uh, to talk about uh, uh, uses of CAPE for asset allocation and relative valuation. I wanted to start just by looking at the data. So this is a plot of the blue line is the S&P Composite Index, also called since 1957 the S&P 500. Before that, they didn't have 500 stocks in it. Uh, so we have it all the way back to 1871, which is before S&P was born, but uh, it's been backdated. And the green line is the earnings per share corresponding to the index. So I, I thought we should just look at the raw data first. This is on my website. Uh, I actually had to do some work to get this uh, data back so that, that far. Jeremy goes even further back with some of his data, but uh, he and I agree that history is important. Why is history important? It's because Big movements in these uh, ratios don't happen that often. If you want to understand what they mean, you better look at uh, the longer history, period of history. So the green line is earnings per share, and the blue line is price per share. Uh, and the, uh, what, do you, what do you learn just by looking at this picture? First of all, earnings is not a random walk, and nobody says it should be. The green line just has kind of a nice uptrend with noise around that, right? There's a lot of people who do time series modeling of earnings. A lot of people are trying to forecast earnings. But just looking at the picture, nice uptrend, but, but short, I mean short, I mean f three to five years or maybe 10 years, deviations from the trend. So you'd think that stock prices shouldn't react to earnings too much because they've gone back down so many times. So, you know, when earnings shoot up a lot, you wouldn't uh, raise your estimated value because you think it's going to come back down, right? Or when it's really low, that was 2009, okay? Uh, you would be really stupid to adjust down stock valuations that much because uh, everybody knows it's going to go back. But sometimes in history, we go the full length. So let me just give you a couple. I, I, I like history, and I could talk more about But let me just give you a couple of examples uh, that you might not be thinking about because they're kind of long ago. There was a huge spike in earnings. It's w the Great War, yes, World War I. That spike occurred before US entered the war. And you know what? The stock market didn't go up very much. Why didn't it? So I go back and I read newspapers from the day. The newspapers called this the flood of earnings, and they attributed it to the war, not surprising. And it was a lot of Europeans buying ammunition and supplies from the United States. It wasn't in the war. And so the market didn't go up. Why didn't it go up? Well, of course, it's just the war. It's not permanent. This, after the war is over, these earnings are going to go back down. And then they thought of a lot of other things, like a railroad strike or uh, uh, so I think the market did the right thing in 1916, okay, which was not to overreact to this sudden burst in earnings. Then I want to go to 1929. The earnings went up again between 1921 and 1929. At this time, the market went up all the way with it. The kind of irrationality that I think came in, in that peaked in 1929 was the overreaction 
They didn't have the skepticism that they had in 1916. Why didn't they? Well, it was a different atmosphere. It was the roaring 20s. They just wanted to believe it. There, not everyone did, though. If you look in the newspapers before 1929, there were various intellectuals saying, watch out. This is, this is overreacting. Uh, I'm just going to give one more example. I want you to look at the 1980s. Earnings were growing pretty well, and, and, the, and the, uh, the price wasn't going up. But you, if you want to go back, each time has its own spirit of the time, or its zeitgeist, as some people call it. What was the spirit of the times in the 80s? Well, it was high inflation, double-digit inflation, and really high interest rates. Franco Modigliani, who was our professor at MIT, with Richard Cohn, in, at that time published an article saying, this is money illusion. This is people comparing these nominal rates, which are only high because of inflation, with this dividend price ratio on the stock market. So there's another case where it didn't react. But look what it's doing now. Uh, earnings shot up in the 90s, uh, and the price shot up as well. And then the earnings shot up in the prior to the financial crisis that occurred 10 years ago, and earnings, uh, earnings shot up and price went up, well, not quite as much. And then here, this is now. It's doing it again. So, you know, I think the question is, should we kind of put ourselves back to 1916 or 1982 thinking? The market is filled with real people, and they have their own stories they're telling and ideas that change from time to time. Right now, we are in this real boom period uh, in terms of earnings. So, so should we think like 1916 or not? Uh, is this temporary? Well, it's kind of fuzzy and ambiguous. Part of the reason earnings are up is because they cut corporate profits taxes, and Donald Trump is president. So is Donald Trump permanent? <laughs> well, I, know, I won't get into that. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, discord about that. So uh, we just don't know. But my way of thinking is it looks like an overreaction. And uh, we're, we're launching on a trade war. I mean, aren't people thinking about that? Uh, isn't that? Is that a good thing? So I don't know, but I'm thinking it's likely to be a bad time for the stock market. Let me get to the uh, CAPE ratio. Uh, we define that as the uh, inflation-adjusted index price divided by a 10-year average of index earnings. And the reason we use a 10-year average is just to smooth out all these noise. And the idea is that if earnings come back, Let's not react to just this year or last year's 12-month trailing earnings. Let's smooth it out. I did this with John Campbell, uh, my, who was my student then in the 1980s. Uh, and we just found that it predicts better. This has been controversial. But the, the um, I think I've already more or less stated what uh, there, there are problems that maybe accounting standards have changed over. Uh, we know they've changed over the years. Uh, and uh, can you really trust the uh, earnings as a means of forecasting? I think so, because uh, uh, I believe in the accounting profession. Their job is to pro provide measures of the success of companies. And what more would you want? But you just don't want to overreact to these short-run fluctuations. So the left chart here shows the price-earnings ratio back to 1871 for the S&P composite. And the right thing shows CAPE. We call it cyclically adjusted because it smooths over the business cycle, uh, or smooths over wars, for that matter. 10 years is a long time for the denomination. Uh, so I, I, just the first thing, just looking at those two pictures, I think that the CAPE ratio tells a better story than the ordinary price earnings ratio, which is very noisy because of all those short-run fluctuations, like 2009, that come up from time to time. The thing is, if you look then just at baskets, uh, ranges, uh, when the CAPE ratio was lowest, it says 8.6, uh, which is a very low CAPE ratio. The stock market has returned uh, very high, 9.8% uh, average. But at the other extreme, 
when the Cape ratio is high at 33, uh, the average is only less than 1%. So that's where we are now. So it's not like I'm predicting a crash. I'm saying this is a 10-year uh, forward return. Now, Jeremy wrote a paper a couple of years ago that's been talked about a lot, uh, looking at different things you could substitute for earnings. Uh, I don't know that uh, you're questioning the basic idea of a longer time interval for earnings in the denominator, but there's uh, a number of variations that have been proposed, uh, including uh, operating earnings, uh, na national income and product account, NIPA earnings, uh, and uh, other things like book value or cash flow. So we can substitute those for CAPE in, uh, in our regressions. There is a problem of regressing overlapping 10-year returns on uh, CAPE because you have price on both sides of the equation. So you have an endogenous regressor problem. Uh, there's a recent paper by Boudouk, Israel, and Richardson that uh, makes a big deal of that issue. Uh, they claim that our results might not be significant. See, what we're going to do, what we did, what Campbell and I did originally is run a regression of 10-year returns on the CAPE ratio. And we got uh, an R-squared, which was substantial, like a third. Uh, but uh, the T-statistics are biased upward if you don't take account of the fact that 10-year uh, intervals sampled at one year, 10-year returns for every year are overlapping. So. Uh, uh, Israel, uh, Boudouk, Israel, and Richardson say we really don't have 150 years of observations because of 10-year returns. It's more like 12 ob observations. So we've done some work on trying to understand that point. Uh, I think that my conclusion is maybe we only have 12 observations of 10-year of returns that don't overlap. But that's enough. <laughs> that. Uh, uh, 12 observations is enough to get statistical significance, and we still do. Uh, so I think, I think that the, uh, this attack on our methods is, is not uh, decisive. We also do corrections for overlapping data with Hansen, Hodrick, and Hjalmarsson corrections. Now, these corrections get criticized, so it's a, it's a constant battle. You know, I, we've proposed, C Campbell and I proposed CAPE ratio 30 years ago. And I would have thought by now I could forget about it, but the attacks keep coming. <laughs> so uh, now this relates to a very important point, which I don't think is that controversial. I, I talked about when I won the Nobel Prize, it was joint with Eugene Fama. It was a little bit difficult sharing the stage with him. Uh, but we found out that we agreed on, what, on at least this point, that stock returns are somewhat forecastable and that the the longer the forecast horizon, the more forecastable they are. If you're trying to predict tomorrow's price change, it's very hard. But if you want to predict five or 10 years, you have a better chance. This is just the reverse of what it is with weather forecasting. <laughs> weather forecasting are telling us what the hurricane is going to do tomorrow, and they're pretty good. But you can't ask them to go out even two weeks. Uh, they're not very accurate anymore. So it's a different thing. But you can see these show the um, forecast uh, uh, R squared uh, for um, various variations on the CAPE ratio. The important thing is to smooth over the business cycle. You can use operating earnings. You can use dividends. You can use uh, book value, cash flow, sales. They're all, uh, they're all kind of forecasting the price is high relative to a long average of any of those, then it, it's, a, it's a sign that the market is uh, likely to go down over the next 10 years. This is the T statistics for the coefficient of the CAPE-like variable for the various uh, different measures. I think that the original uh, reported earnings that Campbell and I used seem to be, that's the blue line, that uh, seem to be fairly consistent. Uh, although at a very short horizon, not, uh, at one quarter hori in forecasting horizon, it's not that uh, not significant. Jeremy, in his article in 2016, uh, said that if you use operating earnings instead of um, 
uh, instead of reported earnings, or if you use NIPA earnings, uh, the overvaluation of the market looks less extreme. And now uh, Farouk went to great efforts to replicate what uh, Jeremy did and does replicate it. So the chart at the left is from Jeremy's article, his 2016 article, uh, and it shows that the highest um, uh, CAPE ratio is the one using reported earnings, and the lowest is the one using NIPA earnings. Uh, so Farouk replicated this result. Oh, although on the right chart, it's updated to 2017, uh, ending in 2017. Again, it looks like the total return CAPE uh, is the highest of, uh, of all of them, of, of all three, operating earnings CAPE or NIPA CAPE. So it seems to matter. Uh, and uh, Jeremy shows uh, in his paper that it implies very different forecasts depending on which one you use. Our CAPE, reported earnings CAPE, was predicting a 2.81% return, excess return. Uh, and uh, his um, predicted much higher, 5.25, using NIPA CAPE. And we, and we sort of replicated that, updating it, but not quite as strongly. Since 2014, the expected return implied by the CAPE, for, by the CAPE ratio has come down because the CAPE ratio has gone up. Farouk discovered a sort of um, odd uh, choice that Jeremy made was uh, to scale the different CAPE ratios by a, a, a long-term CAPE ratio for each. But since the operating earnings don't go as far back in time, or the NIPA earnings don't go as far, they, you can't get them back before 1929, he spliced the other CAPE in, in place of the operating or NIPA CAPE. If we correct that, uh, by not using the split, by just dividing by, scaling by the average for uh, the actual time series, the difference between the three measures is, uh, becomes smaller. The other thing is that opera, NIPA earnings CAPE is not so much different in its appearance than operating. They're both above trend with recent data. So it's not like uh, there's a b huge difference. Let me just finally conclude that about uses of CAPE. So the question is, does portfolio allocation benefit from the use of CAPE? I think it does. Oh, this shows the expected excess return. Uh, we just updated this to, uh, at, for the beginning of September 2018, annualized for various calibration windows and, and horizons. There's a lot in this slide. There's also this question of rolling regressions. Uh, the, you, you, you might not want to use all the history of data to estimate the relationship between CAPE and future earnings. So we picked 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, or 80 years, or the full amount as the calibration window. Uh, and we get a fairly, except for the two years, we don't get a clear forecast for two years. That would be between 2018 and 2020. But when you go out over longer uh, horizons, six or 10 years, we get a fairly uh, consistent picture, uh, d regardless of the uh, calibration window, uh, that expected returns low coming in the next six or 10 years uh, based on historical comparison. This is the, uh, a slide of uh, scatter diagrams with the 10-year uh, return on the vertical axis and the CAPE ratio on the horizontal axis for the UK, Japan, and Europe. So it, work, it works in other countries. I don't mean to make too much of these. These are shorter samples. Uh, but it looks like the CAPE ratio predicts long-term returns in all of these. This is also an inter-country comparison of the significance of the CAPE ratio, the T statistic, for uh, quite a number of countries. And they're compared with this T statistic. We're forecasting returns using both CAPE and PE. The point is that CAPE with reported earnings works better than the price earnings ratio in almost all of these countries uh, as a forecaster of returns. We can use the uh, CAPE ratio to allocate between countries, avoid high CAPE countries like the United States. Uh, a lot of countries have been declining lately in their uh, CAPE ratios, but not the US. 
you know, I think it has something to do with Donald J. Trump, but I, <laughs> I don't know for sure. Uh, so we might want to go between countries uh, allocating based on CAPE, but that might be a little bit uh, tricky because you have to also consider the foreign exchange implications, different accounting rules across countries. So uh, it's not as obvious as it might seem. You can also do it by, you can also go across sectors. You can do a sector CAPE. So here is a uh, plot uh, of uh, industrials on the left and utilities on the right. A plot of, on the horizontal axis, the CAPE ratio, and on the vertical axis, the subsequent uh, returns. Uh, and we see a negative relationship again. I also did this with Oliver Bunn uh, in a 2012 paper, uh, back to 1871. You can get only three sectors back to 1871 industrials, utilities, and railroads. Railroads was big in those days. Uh, and we find it works again. Uh, and uh, Railroads were very fashionable once, and that was a bad time to buy. The good time to buy railroads was during the dot-com boom, okay? When, they, when railroads were completely forgotten by most investors. Uh, so um, uh, I'll just wrap it up with that, saying that I don't, I don't think that the the argument that Jeremy and I have about whether it's NIPA earnings or uh, reported earnings is, is fundamental. I think that uh, and, and it's not true that Jeremy and I have always been bull versus bear. In 2000, we were both bears. And Jeremy wrote a fine Wall, was it Wall Street Journal article saying any stock with a price earnings ratio over 100 has to be looked at very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. That was very nice. Uh -huh. So the big long run. As Bob said, I went back a little bit further in 1871. This is total real return for stocks, bonds, treasury bills, gold, and the value of the US dollar itself. By the way, Bob and I agree. There's mean reversion. It's not a random walk what our professor Samuel seems to call red noise. There's, there's the least squares regression through that point, and there's, it's definitely uh, a mean reverting line. Uh, let me show you what the real returns are there at the left. So long run real return on stocks is 6.7% per year. Bonds, three and a half. Bills, two six, gold, zero five, and the dollar down about one and a half percent a year. Almost all, all that dollar depreciation since uh, the, the 1930s, the going off the gold standard, as you can see. Well, we're not going to have that high in, in, in stocks. Uh, we're definitely not going to have that high in bonds. Wow, I mean, it's almost shocking to think real, but this is real bonds, 3.5% going all the way through time. So let's take a look at something more modern, which you can put on your Bloomberg screen. Uh, you can get the S&P uh, from 1954 to 2018. That's, that's 64 years. Uh, the median over that period is 17. You can see that with that. There's the median. The lower is when we had double-digit inflation. Um, that's big negative for stocks. That's also when we had double-digit interest rates. Uh, the all-time high is definitely when we were 30 for the S&P 500, and that was in 2000. Definitely uh, overvalued. But you can see, really, we're not that high. This is on the basis of last 12 months of earnings. We're actually just, uh, just below 20 there. But let's take a look at earnings a little bit more important. And th there's really three definitions of earnings. There's firm reported earnings, which are the most liberal. Uh, you know, uh, they, they really kind of can choose what they want to exclude and disclude, asset impairment, severance costs. In my book, I have a whole list of what they do. That's 2017, the estimate of 18, and the estimate of 19. The type of earnings that I like to look at are called S&P operating earnings. Now, actually, they used to be called S&P core earnings. They tried to unify among them. They expense uh, pension value changes, stock option expenses, and all the rest. There are some things that they do exclude. But I think they're the best way to look at it. 2017 is 120, uh, 124.51. This year's estimate, the latest, is 157.79. And don't forget, we're you know you know we're well into the third quarter 
well, we're going to you know, get the third quarter of earnings into the fourth quarter already. So that's a number, I think, 2018, that is a pretty good number, 158. I think, one, I think next year, 177 is too high, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Then you have gap earnings or reported earnings. Now, the, the problem is, and, and, and Bob did this work, I guess, you, you know, as he said, in the 1990s, S&P gap changed its definition of earnings right after Bob did his work. It went to mark to market, which is, uh, in my opinion, a, a seri- first of all, I think it's wrong um, for what it tries to measure. It mandates write downs and asset impairments, whether the asset is sold or not. That never used to happen. And by the way, interestingly enough, it doesn't permit you to write up the asset unless you sell it and prove that there's actually value. So it's almost a, a one-way bias. And in recessions, you get big write-downs, and I'm going to show you how this compares to the past, which I think gives you big uh, problems. 2017, 109, estimate of this year is 142, 99. So it's about, what, $13, $15 less, $14 less, and that's the estimate of 2009. By the way, in the very last annual report of Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, they've made even further changes in, in gap earnings and his statement is, the new mark-to-market rules make gap earnings for analytical purposes, and he used the term useless. That's right on page one. Useless for any tor- sort of ongoing valuation of the firm. I'm going to use the middle. I mean, we're not talking about that much difference, but when I talk about s and I'm going to be using the middle lines there. Now, the earnings yield is a very good predictor of long-term returns. Uh, the long-term P-E ratio over 140 years is around 15, and one over 15 is 6.7. Hey, you've seen that number. It's theoretically what it should be. It's empirically what it should be. The earnings yield, stocks are real val- uh, assets. The earnings yield should be the real return, and it is the real return in the long run. No mystery here at all. So where are we right now? Well, when I did these slides a few days ago, the S&P was 28.71. I think we're a couple points higher now. Stocks are selling for 18 times this year's earnings. And this year's earnings are pretty firm. So the market doesn't go up much more by December 31st. Backward looking, we will be at 18 earnings. Now, we're only selling at 16 one times next year's earnings. Again, I'm using operating, not using firm reported. They're lower on firm reported. I'm using what I call the middle of the road, look at the earnings, uh, 16 times one times that. But I'm not going to do the forward. I'm going to use the 18. One over 18 is 5.5%. So people ask me, Jeremy, what do you think today's stock market is forecasting forward? I say 5.5% real right now. That's lower by a point or so from the long run. Nominal, if you have a 2% inflation, is 7.5%. Uh, by the way, since our long bond is less than 3, I'm using the 10-year, we have an equity risk premium of about 4.5%, which is lower than the long-run average of 3 to 3.5% for the equity risk premium. So yes, stocks are, quote, overvalued on a longer-term basis, but bonds are enormously overvalued on a long-term basis. So really, the relative valuation of stocks with, relative to bonds is actually uh, among the more favorable, not the most favorable, but among the more favorable in, in history. By the way, people ask me, how do you going to get 5.5% real? Well, I'll tell you. Basically, it, we're at about, about a 2% dividend. Um, and about 3.5%, in my estimate, is going to be real earnings per share growth. By the way, that estimate is way below almost all Wall Street analysts. But I think over the next three to five years, you're going to have 3.5% earnings per share growth. By the way, almost 2.5% is caused by buybacks. It, one, one of the amazing things through history is how little real earnings per share growth has to do with uh, g- GDP. Real economic. Cyclically, it is an important factor, but in the long run, it's not an important factor. And the reason for that actually is that firms need more capital 
and therefore they have to dilute that earnings in order to produce that higher growth. So you're only getting 1% from intrinsic organic growth, 2.5% is going to be buybacks, that's 3.5%, add the 2% dividend, that's your 5.5% real return going uh, forward there. Now, here's, here's, here's something that I think is important when I get to the CAPE ratio. All of Bob's and, and everyone's stuff goes back to the long run normal. Well, you know, the, the reversion to the normal is a big reason why the CAPE is a pessimistic at the present time. But we should ask a, a good question. Should we go back to 15 as the long run or normal? Or for CAPE, because it's a it's distributed lag, uh, 16 and a half uh, uh, or so on that. Well, my feeling is, no, we shouldn't. I say that the warranted price earnings ratio is higher than history. And one of the reasons for that is indexing at zero cost, which was totally unavailable for investors during the greatest part of this sample. Let me talk a little bit more about that. Yes, the index return over the 19th and first half of the 20th century is about 6.5% year. But what do you think the average investor could get if you take into account brokerage costs back then to balance your portfolio, bid-ask spreads, which are higher than today. I mean, S&P just tells you what it's going to have to do for the third quarter and how many times you have to make changes on your portfolio. I know it's supposed to be a buy-and-hold portfolio, but the way they calculate it is really not exactly that. I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that it would cost you maybe about 1% to 1.5% per year back then to do it. Now it's zero. So what does this mean? Were you really getting 6.7% in the 19th and early 20th century? No. At best, you're probably getting 5% real. Well, 5% real actually corresponds to a 20 PE ratio. 5.5% real would correspond to that 18. So given that costs have gone to zero of maintaining a fully diversified, efficient portfolio. That in and of itself argues, in my opinion, for a higher equilibrium P-E ratio than historically. So really, we never were getting 6-7. On a risk-adjusted basis, at best, you were probably getting 5 to 5.5%. Five so 18 P-E ratio is 5.5%. You could almost call that a new normal of a zero transaction cost. And by the way, I'm not even talking about interest rates being record low, which could maybe inflate the ratio. I mean, Bob and I have sort of disagreed about whether interest rates, how they affect their lower interest rates are also caused by higher risk aversions, which you know, will lower stock prices and, and push up the equity premium. I'm not going to get into that issue at all. I'm just talking about transactions cost, the ability to, to diversify and the liquidity of today's market doesn't give you 15, it gives you closer to 18. And by the way, the fact that the, the, the earnings per share growth has gone up, you know, I, I mean, I, this is an updated chart. First of all, 1871 to 2018, and I divided up to up to World War I and then after World War I. You notice the dividend yield has gone down from 5.3 to 3.3, three, three, a two percentage points, and the real earnings per share growth has actually gone up about two and a half percentage points. Theory would tell you for every one percentage point reduction in the dividend yield, there should be a one percentage point increase in earnings per share growth. Now, that leads to a distortion in Bob's cape because Bob assumes a constant real earnings per share. Growth, if there's going to be a lower dividend yield cause is a higher, then the CAPE ratio is going to be different, right, Bob, from what it would be otherwise. That's why, by, by the way, Bob actually moved to what's called a total return CAPE, which is different from the CAPE that's published, I think, on your website, which is not a total return CAPE, which makes the correction for that difference that you have. Bob talked about his ratio. I updated it. It looks like my, when my dad, I got 32 um, based on gap earnings, uh, which is what he follows over there. Nearly double the long run average. Uh, his methodology, I, I guess, gives about 2.6% going forward. So that's about half of what I say. That's a real return. Uh, only 40% a long run. 
By the way, two six is still better than bonds going forward. But again, remember, a lot of that is reversion. If we stay at the current ratio, you're, not going, you're going to get a much higher ratio than that. Here is Bob's CAPE ratio. I know when I looked at that, do you notice there's a median 6.9, 31.9 now, that you're almost all in the last 30 years above the line. In fact, the only time you were below the line was a six, you know, a, a six or nine month period right on the financial crisis. So basically over the last 30 years, you've never been undervalued, except for a few months at the bottom of the worst bear market in 75 years. That looked strange to me. By the way, if you do it on operating earnings, you do see it comes down. Bob, you know, that, that it's down to 27.5 instead of 31. And by the way, as we all know, the 2009-10 is still in there for 10 years. It's going to drop out in a couple years, and I'm going to talk about that. Here's Bob's earnings. I, I saw this big drop, as he talked about, in 2008-2009. In by the way, that's the, the, Bob talked about World War I. That's the Depression. Well, when I saw this, I said, just a minute, something's wrong. The, the latest financial crisis, as bad as it is, is nowhere as bad as the Great Depression of the 30s. I think Bob would realize. Yet the drop, percentage drop in log earnings, well, percentage drop in earnings, as illustrated by the log earnings graph, was approximately two to three times as much. Furthermore, you see this, that previous, that's a 1990 recession, um, I mean, excuse me, that's a 2000 recession, that was the mildest recession we had in post-war period, and yet the drop was one of the biggest. And that is when I said, oh, now, how about let's take operating earnings. You see operating earnings are now on top. Notice that the declines on the spikes in operating earnings are much diminished because of mark to market. Those big declines are mark to market changes that FASB introduced. So you're averaging really low numbers in there. Now, I'm not arguing whether one is better than the other. I know when this was discussed in Economist Magazine, they had a big article, oh, Dr. Siegel doesn't, doesn't like mark to market. And I said, listen, all I say is be consistent. If you're going to do mark to market in 2000 and 2008, then do mark to market everywhere. Of course, we don't have, really have that data. But those declines would have been much more in the previous years. In fact, I matched the declines of the operating with the actual severity of the recession in the NIPA accounts, and it was one for one. If you do it with reported, it's all distorted since 1990 because of the mark to market. By the way, there's NIPA profits. You can go in and look at it. And again, it doesn't give the decline that you, you had had. Um, before. I said, oh wow, you're getting a lot of this from the fact that you, you know, you, we've had a change. I mean, it's not Bob's fault that FASB changed, um, but we've had a change in the way of the accounting. And those big, you know, really low numbers, but it was something else I talked in the article about aggregation bias, and I won't go into that right now. Three firms, Citibank, uh, Bank America, and AIG, basically wiped out over 50% of the earnings of the other. And that, you can't aggregate earnings to figure out P.E. ratio. I mean, that's absolutely a wrong way to do it. It's not one firm. It has to do with options versus the other. I won't go into that particular. It's called the aggregation bias on there. But basically, for two or three more years, you have this really low number. Don't forget, Bob's 10-year average is unweighted. So 2008, 2009 has exactly the same weight as 2017 and 2018 does uh, in, in the earnings data. There it is, uh, redoing it on a total return basis, NIPA operating and reported by Bob actually uh, did, did show that. But this is the one I, I really uh, want to concentrate on. This is really the last slide outside of that for here. Um, so I'm just looking here on the operating. Um, and let us assume, going forward, we only have a 3.5% real EPS growth. Again, that is below every Wall Street estimate on long-term growth. But I think it's realistic. That's 3.5% after inflation per year. That gives me 
my 5.5% return. Now, take a look. Do you see the convergence? That, so if we're forecasting it, and I'm, I'm using Bob's own ratio here, and I'm projecting it out, and guess what it converts to over here, right over here to 21 and a half. 21 and a half is the PE that gives you a 5.5% real return and is consistent with an 18% one-year PE. Remember, the KPE is always above the one year. And since we have faster growth now because we have lower dividends, that distortion between the average PE and the KPE is actually greater now than it would be historically. So there is what it would look like. In other words, staying at this level, converges down smoothly 21.5, we have 5%, 5.5% forever. That would be steady saying, obviously, that's not the way the world works. We're going to fluctuate around there. But it's really important to focus on what is the long run cape going to be. It's certainly, I mean, even if you, you know, even if you go back to the 6.7, which I don't think it's going to be that high, you don't get back to the cape that Bob did because earnings share growth is faster. And so therefore, this, the steady state average is going to be faster. Uh, the, 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 the ratio of the CAPE to the steady state average is going to be higher. But I think that that is what I think is why people ask me, is CAPE is 18 that we have today a long run? Absolutely could be the long run. Does it correspond with every other long run data we have? Absolutely. Why is there a difference on there? Well, I could argue interest rates, but I'm not. I'm going to argue transactions costs. And I guess if I asked most of you if you thought 5.5% real would please your clients on equities, most of you would probably nod your head yes. And I'm not saying anything more. Again, I did talk about, um, so 21.5 CAPE is consistent with a current 18.5 and a 5.5% and real equity return. Again, I talked about this in, in this paper, uh, 2016 FAG, because the short CAPE ratio and new look. And listen, B Bob started us on that. Bob recognized the mean reversion. I see it too. There's just been a number of changes that I think have taken it off that gives you a different long run uh, picture on equity returns. Um, but thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Bob, so very much for your, uh, for your comments and your presentation. So we're going to open up for questions. Uh, in, one, in one moment, but I'd, I'd like to uh, ask um, each of you uh, to respond maybe to one question initially, which is it's not only uh, stocks, as you mentioned, it's bonds that are often referred to as being overpriced, and that includes high yield. Uh, we often hear today the, uh, the, 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 the notion of uh, investors tilting into yield. Uh, it's in real assets, real estate. Has anyone checked cap, ra uh, cap ratios and uh, cap rates in New York? Uh, they're historically low. Uh, we also have heard a lot made of in the practitioner press and also in academics about other indicators like the slope of the term structure of interest rates, which over predicts recessions, but predicts economic activity, which because the market does perhaps there's a correlation. When we think about the span of classes of assets and the slope of the ter term structure of interest rates, how does it change your thinking or does it at all? Bob? I'm writing another book now <laughs> called Narrative Economics. And I'm thinking that a lot of these things are driven by just the story of the time. The, mm. uh, and, uh, you, you talk about different asset classes. I, let's go back to 1929. What was the story of that time? Uh, that was um, right after a, a big housing boom and crash. Mm. Remember the Florida land bubble? They call it land bubble, but it was a real estate boom. It affected went way beyond Florida, but it wasn't contemporaneous. Right now, we've got them, we've got high real estate prices and high stock prices happening at the same time. But it was it was um, there was a story, a sense of glamour, opportunity. I, I don't quite know how to uh, pin it down. Oh, one thought I had about from Jeremy's comment is in 1930, Irving Fisher wrote a book called The Stock Market Crash and After which was very optimistic about the stock market. And his arguments sound vaguely familiar to Jer Jeremy's. <laughs> he said that now in modern times, 1930, 
investors are much more sophisticated, and they know that the stock market has outperformed other assets over the long run. And they know that they can diversify their portfolios. And they even had uh, funds that would help them to do that. Maybe not as good and not as cheap. But, uh, so he predicted a brilliant future for the stock market uh, in 1930. That was a mistake. That was a short run mistake. Maybe in the long run, okay. So I, I'm I'm trying to pin it down. What is the zeitgeist today? What is the atmosphere? And it's a time in history when we not only have Donald Trump in the United States, but we have populist leaders around the world and a kind of nationalist uh, tendency. I, I don't know what goes along with that. It, it's sort of a uh, it's also not a friendly time. Okay? It's not a time where we're compassionate about poor people. Uh, it's leading to an atmosphere, which I'm, I can't speak precisely about it, but it's kind of a capitalist rat race atmosphere that I think is, is happening. And where will this go? Uh, I think we have to go beyond looking at CAPE ratios or any other ratio to try to understand where this, it, it, it involves broader thinking uh, that I can't offer anything conclusive about right now. And it's an interesting comment Bob made about uh, Irving Fisher. Um, one thing I did not bring into these arguments, you know, economists have a hard time explaining the equity risk premium, that it, it seems way too high. Um, and you know, some people, and, and in fact, the book, Dow 36,000, was written, and they said, well, look, at Jeremy said that stocks are really not that much riskier than nominal bonds at that point because of inflation uncertainty. So maybe the risk premium should be zero. So, you know, we're paying 2% on stocks, so that argues a 50 PE ratio. Others have said, well, you know, that Marin Prescott in that famous article showed that the, the risk premium on stocks should be about a half a percent or so. I mean, if you apply those, you get astronomical views uh, on, on how high stock prices, and I'm not even introducing that into there. In fact, the equity premium, as I said, right now is high on a historical basis. I mean, you know, 10-year tips are under 1%, uh, 30-year are just about one, and there's other there are the risks on that, and yet, you know, I said stocks are five and a half at current valuations. If they stay at the, the and that's a big margin. And one could argue that margin should be smaller. If you, know, if you argue the margin should be 2 or 3%, then you do go up to a 30 PE, and then you do go up to a, that's a 3.3% real, if you, if you invert that, and you can play around that way. So, but I didn't go that direction. Um, you know, I sort of thought that, you know, that indexation is zero cost indexation. It's so popular. Remember, Listen, we all, the average cost of mutual funds in, in Irving Fisher's day, I mean, even up until the 60s, 70s, was 2% a year. And they couldn't outperform the index, and they were probably underperforming the index. So you were definitely lagging by that amount. Today, there's no need, you don't lag. I mean, unless you're, you know, you're trying to beat and don't. But today, you really do have the vehicle of, of vegetable. I do want to comment on, you know, what Chris said about real estate price, and that does come into the fact that our real rates of return are very low. And I, I believe that that has to do with fundamentals, that growth is low, population growth is low. I also think risk aversion is a bit higher. I think, you know, we have an aging investor class, you know, a little bit more risk aversion in there. And we, we've had two big bear markets in the last 15 years. So that's one reason you have a higher uh, equity risk premium, I think, uh, there. But real rates are, are low and likely to stay low below their average that we used to know for quite a while. And I mean, that would cause real estate to be at a higher price. And by the way, internationally, US real estate is considered cheap. If you actually look at, at price rental ratios around the world, they've gone up much more than they have in the United States. Now, I'm not saying that is rational. I'm just saying that it's not you know, a local bubble. Now, if you think real rates are going to go back up, you know, to, you know, two, three, four percent, then then real estate's going to have trouble, and stocks are going to have trouble, and bonds are going to have trouble, right? I mean, only cash will not have trouble if real rates go up. 
Uh, but at least stocks, if real rates go up, and part of the reason is real economic growth, then you're going to have some benefit on the earnings side that will cushion the stocks against the others. And, but, mul uh, and multiples expansion. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's about it. So, yeah, you know, that's my comment. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's open it for questions. How can you adjust for the uh, sectoral change in the S&P over the last two, two decades, um, the preponderance of the tech stocks, the, uh, the FANG stocks, and, and others? And on a related note, is there any way to extend this type of analysis to, to the NASDAQ? The, the sectors are a big challenge. Right now, S&P is redefining its sectors. <laughs> there are people who have tried to make adjustments. Or especially, I was mentioning comparing across countries where uh, a different country may emphasize a different sector. I think that's a useful uh, line. W what I've done uh, hasn't been so much trying to correct the aggregate, but to look at the s separate sectors individually. Uh, and you, you can do sector allocation uh, using CAPE ratios. And I guess that would uh, imply a different uh, portfolio than just an aggregate uh, uh, market portfolio. Uh, let me comment. We all know that you know, the last 10 years have been a really good time for growth stocks. Uh, value has tended to lag. Um, uh, and, and people who, you know, value shops are, we're kind of suffering as a result of that. And there's a question of is this a, is this a new paradigm or is this uh, something that's, that's going to last? One thing that I found that when I, when I was writing my book, and, and uh, you know, then at that time, back in the 90s, we only had the, the small, large value growth uh, to factor, you know, Fama French, and not to all these momentum and quality and other things that have come in since. But one thing I noticed when I was looking at these factors uh, was how streaky they were in the sense that, that that there would be long periods where they would out show very strong and outperform, and then there would be a long periods where they wouldn't. Uh, you know, we, we, and overall, you, you say, oh, I got a one or one and a half percent gain, and you think it's random, and you know, every three or four years, you're, you're gonna get an average on that. And it didn't seem to work, work that way. And one of the, the biggest thing that I saw was looking at small stocks and large stocks, and there was a small stocks, pre remember all we one talked about the small stock premium that uh, seemed to you know, be so important. Um, and when I looked at it from 1929 all the way to the present, uh, when I did this in the late 90s, I found that all the small stock premium was due to a nine year period from 1975 to 83. Uh, contiguous for a nine year period. Um, of unbelievable outperformance of small stocks, and over the remaining 70 years or 80 years, actually they underperformed. So I mean, so here was something that was supposed to be a persistent type of a factor that really showed up in one decade, in less than you know, less than a decade, and then tended to disappear. Now, subsequent to my book, there's been another kind of small stock revival, you know, recently, but. This was from 1929 all the way to the year 2000, and it was really quite striking. So is, is that what's happening now? You know, we've had the fang out performance. Is this, is, is, is this a new paradigm, or is it just something, a streak, that is gonna come to the end? Now, no one knows for sure, but I did want to mention that other such uh, uh, factors have showed a lot of autocorrelation and streakiness um, that, that subsequently disappeared. And, and value so far this year, even yeah. sector adjusted, has been challenged. Yes, right. right. So, open question. I think the question you're argued for the NEPA is great measurement, but some way feel like this is more short term, I guess, long term. Bob is uh, like a cave, is over 100 years. The number you talk about, essentially, either you argue some regime switch or some short-term measurement. If you look at history over time, there are quite some period, like it's a bubble, like it's a financial, like a internet bubble period. People talk about this, there's no relevance anymore market for the earning. But turns out that's not true. Same way, there's so many other, I can argue that over different period of time, you can see 
say cash flow could be much better measurement, but long run, I think that that's a cave. It seems it works still pretty well. In terms of your case, you know, you particularly talk about the index. We come with Vanguard, you know, we do all the index a lot, but I don't see particular connection. What's the index popularity or some zero cost? Drive this cape ratio is not working. Drive to your Nepal world. And uh, on the other word, long run, if we want to see your measures better, should we wait another maybe 20, 30 years? Is that still continue to be true? Well, okay, there's a lot of, a lot of points. One point and is that either NIPA or operating matched the business cycle in terms of the depth of earnings drop, which GAP did not. It did before the changes were made, but not subsequent to the changes. So both NIPA and operating showed a much, much smaller drop in the financial crisis. So you, those low numbers that Bob averages down there, obviously, which will you know, eventually come out as we go to 2019 and 2020, uh, will be there. I mean, as far as, as, as indexing is concerned, um, I mean, obviously, uh, we have a record amount indexed, and it's increasing all the time. So people are basically, I mean, this has never happened before. I mean, you know, uh, this, this has never happened to the degree that we have before that people are just accept. I think that that leads to a higher equilibrium level, you know, of stock prices, um, uh, certainly given the real rate of return. You know, and I said 18 is, is you might think of as a new normal of, 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 uh, of PE ratio rather than 15, and this is one year uh, as a, a normal. So we're at the normal, we're not underpriced. Um, uh, we're not really overpriced. The only, only argument one could get to in overpricing is this whole question about, well, Jeremy, aren't we nine years into an economic expansion and how long is it going to last? And have you built in a, in a recession uh, into that long run? And I, t I'm working on that and I have not. If, a, a preliminary is if you build recessions into my long run um, and the average drop in earnings that we experience, let's say over a 10 year period, when you take a look at that, you get, uh, you drop from five to a little over five zero, five one or five two, and this is very preliminary, so I didn't put it up here in terms of that. So that would be a, a recession corrected one if you're taking a look at it. I mean, I definitely think, I mean, the, the business cycle definitely seems to be longer. Uh, you know, we, we, we went through the longest one up to 1992,000 was the longest, and then if we go to July next year, we will, we will break that record. So there's a question of whether even 10 years can cover, you know, Bob did 10 years because that generally covered a business cycle. Well, we're not so sure that that would necessarily cover a business cycle uh, any longer. But I, I, do, I do accept that, um, you, you know, I don't think a world of no recessions is the right way to look at it, but I think if you take an average recession and a bite out of that earnings, and you subtract out that, you'll get to somewhere in the low fives as uh, what the real return is on stocks going forward. To make sure we have time for one more question right here in the middle. What happens when 2008 drops out? How does that affect your thinking uh, going forward with the CAPE ratio? And to Professor Siegel, 2.5% of your 3.5% is coming from stock buybacks. Do you care where that stock buybacks come from? Is it from cash flow or are they borrowing and, and risking the portfolio of the balance, balance sheet? Does that matter to you? Oh, yeah. Well, we've done some uh, simulations of what will happen when 2000, it's actually 2009 was uh, uh, very low earnings. Uh, and that will cause the CAPE ratio as calculated to come down, what, a couple of points. Uh, I, you know, I thought maybe I should have done a different, uh, like an exponentially decaying weight, but uh, it seems to work pretty well as is, and so I haven't, I haven't adjusted that. So, yes, most of it, most of it is in, in, in buybacks, 
but that's, that's from, so if you're selling at 18 times earnings, that means you're earning five and a half percent on that. If you pay 2%, let's say, out as dividends, that leaves you with three and a half percent. About 1% is being invested, or at most 1% is being invested back in the company. Companies don't really need to invest much anymore. They're, they're basically filling demand, so they buy back their stock, and that raises EPS by over time by exactly that amount of the buyback. No need to borrow. Now, many com countries, uh, companies did borrow because they had that cash stranded in Europe, like Apple. So Apple borrowed for its buyback, but I don't think it needs to borrow from a buyback now with the new corporate tax rules of being able to access that cash. They couldn't access that cash without paying the corporate tax. So really, it, uh, that two and a half does not need at all to come out of any uh, borrowing at all. It just comes out of the cash flow uh, from the corporation. Bob and Jeremy, thank you so much for your presentations. Please join me in thanking.